musician is a diamond. The sunlight is the music. You don't have to create the colors. They come through you and certain ones that are amplified and certain sounds, certain things you hear, that's what everyone experiences. And when you're practicing, you're not creating music, you're polishing the diamond. Warning. This episode contains adult language and adult humor. Since when have trumpet players ever been considered adults? If you are easily offended by these types of conversations, consider switching to the oboe. Welcome to the Trumpet Gurus Hang Podcast. I'm your host, Jose Johnson. My guest for this episode is James Morrison. James is a true Renaissance man, a virtuoso trumpet player. He can play blazing jazz and burn and lead, but he's also equally at home on trombone, saxophone, piano, and bass. Never one to do things in a small way, James has also founded a university program, designed a studio, and is a pilot, sailor, and professional driver as well. And his approach to life and music will completely blow your mind. So, pour yourself a big glass, pull up a chair, and let the hang begin. Welcome to this amazing episode of the Trumpet Gurus Hang podcast. This is going to be the celebration of one year of broadcasting. So uh, my my first guest last year when I started was uh, my good friend Wayne Bergeron, one of the, the great lead trumpet players of all time. And my guest for the beginning of season two is without a doubt one of the world's greatest musicians, not just trumpet players, but musicians, the one and only James Morrison. So James, I am so pleased to have you on the show today. Thank you. Wow, what a welcome. That's uh, wonderful. All the way from Australia. Man, we, we've uh, we've been dealing with time uh, time uh, <laughs> zone issues and things like that, but it's just so great to have you here. Um, so I just want to dive straight into things because I know uh, as a, it's, it's early in the morning here in the U.S. as I'm recording this, and it's late, or it's actually really early in the morning <laughs> in yeah. Australia. Yeah. But... Um, James, I just, I just wanted to ask you uh, something about your approach to music. Uh, you are a extremely talented musician all around. Uh, you know, your trumpet playing obviously you know, speaks for itself. Your trombone, saxophone, piano, uh, bass. I mean, is there anything you can't do? That that's the first question. What what what's your what's your kryptonite? What's your weakness there, James? Oh, Jose, there's lots I can't do. I mean, I don't play the drums at all. Um, but, you know, there's lots of things. Look, you know, what it really is is that the things I can do are because growing up I, I didn't have a specific teacher. So I just, um, you know, I didn't have anyone to tell me that you weren't supposed to do that. So when I heard someone play the saxophone or the piano or the bass or whatever and I liked it, I said, oh, that sounds great. I want to do that too. And I just did it. So, but I, I basically play the instruments that are in a big band other than the drums. That's probably the easiest way to put it. I I'm I'm no flute player, that's for sure, and you know I don't play any of the other strings other than the bass, and and uh, I know, and the reason I never got on the drums, I don't want anyone thinking out there I didn't like the drums. My brother's a drummer, so he was always on the kit, so that was taken. So I just played everything else. Oh, okay, okay. So so your your family is musical. Yeah, yeah. My my sister's also a trumpeter. My as I said, my brother's a drummer, and uh, my mum plays alto sax and piano, and so. There was lots of music going on. Okay. Well, yeah, that's really interesting that the statement that you made, and I think that, you know, I want to make sure people catch this, that you you said you didn't have anybody to tell you what you couldn't do. And that, I think, is something that, that's missing in terms of the way we approach not just music, but just kind of life in general, that we're, we tend to, to inundate uh, youth with uh, the ideas of the things that, that they they cannot do, that they're not capable of doing, that, that they're not going to be able to to achieve any level of, of uh, proficiency in, as opposed to uh, giving them a wide open space to play in. So, um, you know, is that something that, that's been critical to you in terms of the way that you approach teaching others? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. No, we're always talking about when I'm teaching that the conversation in the room is always about what we want to happen, what we're imagining, you know, and then how to make that happen. Never about what we're not going to do or what you can't do or anything like that. And and also I think um, it's really important. I, uh, 
I have a, I'm a great believer in the fact that rather than teaching someone how to do something or even what to do, um, and I know we, we've talked about this, you know, we start with the why they're going to do it. And, and I believe if you've got a young student like starting off, off, off right from the beginning, they might need, they're might they not going to have defined probably in, in any you know meaningful way why they're doing this. It's just an impetus. They just want to do it. Um, but if I'm going to teach anything, I like to start by we experience it first. So we're going to learn how something about a particular, you know, thing in improvisation with harmonies, or we're going to learn a technique on the trumpet or how to make a certain sound. I start by making the sound or experiencing those harmonies, whatever it is, and say, how does that make you feel? Like, isn't that great? Like, are we, we're going to do that. And when someone says, yeah, I want that, I want to make that sound or I want to create that feeling, then the next thing I do is we, we do it. We actually do it without knowing how or why it works or the theory behind it. We just go straight to how do you actually do this? And once they're doing it and they're making that feeling and they're going, wow, that feels great. I go, okay, now here's why it works, <laughs> you know, and then we go to the theory. Theory is still important. It still has a place, but I always use theory to describe what just happened rather uh-huh. than as a way to lead us to something to try and make it happen. And I think, you know, there's a great example of that being the way humans learn best is that's how we learn to speak. Right. I mean, you imagine, you know, once you can talk, I mean, speak to a three-year-old, right? You know, ask them how the trip to the zoo was, right? As long as you got an hour and a half, because then they're going to tell you about all the animals, <laughs> everything that happened. And if you said to them, explain an adverb to me, I mean, you're going to get a blank look. Which animal was that? You know, right. um, And yet they will have just used a whole lot of adjectives, adverbs. They'll have, they'll have conjugated verbs. They'll have done all sorts of stuff. Ask them to spell any of the animals. I mean, um, maybe some three-year-olds can. I don't know. What I'm getting at is later after they can actually speak, we teach the alphabet and how to read. And, 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 and then finally, after that even, we start talking about the parts of speech and all the theory behind it. And, and yeah, if you're going to be a great author or extremely eloquent, yeah, at some stage you want to learn all of that. But imagine if we started that way and got a baby and said, okay, instead of saying just saying mama or something like that, we said, now this is a proper noun and it refers to a person and it needs a capital letter. I mean, you'd get nowhere. And yet somehow, often we go to teach music, we sit down a person who's never played music and we say, okay, this is a stave, this is the note, names of the notes have letters and, and you start, you kidding me? Like pick up the instrument and make a sound. You know, right. and don't worry about put your tongue here or your teeth there or do this with your breath. Just make the sound. I have not struck a human being yet that if I blow a trumpet in front of them and hand it to them and say, you do it, doesn't make a sound. You know, but if you tell them something, they focus on what you told them. Right. And they focus on that part of their body. If you make the sound and then just hand them the trumpet, all they've got to focus on is the sound. Mm-hmm. And after all, that's the bit we want. Right. <laughs> so. Right. Well, that, I mean, that, that is so critical. I think that, um, you know, when we, when we look at the, the basic way we learn, as you're saying, like, you know, the way we learn language, the way we learn to walk, all yep. of it is trial and error. And, um, you know, we tend to want to, as adults, we want children or younger people to process things the way that we're processing them as already masters of our craft and, yeah. um, you know, and whether it's, it's teaching a, a eight year old or it's teaching a, a 50 year old who's never touched an instrument in their life, they're starting at ground zero. And, you know, we, you can't approach something from 40, 50 years of experience and explain it to someone who has zero experience from our perspective. You have to start at the beginning, which is just, you know, hey, let's let's have fun and let's make mistakes and let's learn in the process. Yeah. And that is so true, Jose, but also if I've got an expert in front of me who's a great player but wants to learn something new about playing and it happens to be something I know and I'm, I'm in the position of teaching them, same deal. I don't go, well, you, you, you know lots of stuff already, so I'll teach that other way. I go, no, the best way to learn this is still that, whatever it is. Let's experience it first. Let's experience it first and let's get what that feels like and what it's like to be in the room when that happens and then we'll find out. You yeah. know how it works. Yeah, I and, love that. Um, I always find that's better. Yeah, experience and then explain. That's yeah, that, that's great. Uh, and and speaking, of, so you know, you come you come from this family that that obviously has music all around you, and you're you're basically immersed in the language of music. So um, obviously that that has helped you in terms of your development 
because you know it, it's kind of part of your I don't want to say it's part of your DNA, um, although some people would argue that maybe it is. But it's just something that, that you've been exposed to from, you know, it's just part part of the way you approach life. Um, so there's a level of talent there. But there also has to be a level of tenacity, I think, that, that people have in terms of, of taking those raw talents and those raw uh, components that are already there and putting them together and being willing to just to go through the process. So uh, from your perspective, uh, what do you feel is uh, the, the best situation to, to have to have the natural raw talent uh, or to just have that that mm-hmm. tenacious attitude of, you know, I'm just, I'm going for this. I love it. And I, I just want to dive into it and I want to immerse myself in it. Do you know what? If you've put that as a, as a, as a either or question, and my answer is, you know, like, which is better this or that mm-hmm. is neither of those is going to get you there without the other one. Okay. Good. <laughs> you need them both. Yeah. If there's an emphasis one way, gee, I, I don't know. Um, I think it's, I think it's um, cause I've met people who work really hard and just would describe that musical. Mm-hmm. They love it, but they don't, there's something they don't have, but they work hard at it and they can play, but they're never going to reach, you know, um, great heights because they just don't, there's something they don't have. Then I've met people who just have this natural talent and haven't gone as far as they could because they were lazy with it, you know, and, and didn't, didn't do the work that was needed. And you see that too. I often, I've met people like that and I go, you guys should get together <laughs> and like become one person because right. you'd be great. Right. Um, so I think you need both, um, but I, I, I got to say, and this might be a little controversial, but look, you know, it's, it's an experience I have. I, I do a lot of teaching. I have my own academy, so I've got a lot of students, and um, they're at, a, at what we call a tertiary level here. That's like university, you know, college, and so they're out of high school, and so they're pretty serious, you know. I mean, they're, they're not like just playing in the high school band because they they've got to or it's fun or whatever. Mm-hmm. They've left school. They made a choice to actually go on and study music specifically, do a bachelor degree or whatever. So you'd expect they'd be they'd be pretty committed. And I still strike this thing with a, an inordinate number of students, like, you know, it's not just one or two, where at some stage they say, oh, I'm just having trouble, you know, motivating myself and, um, you know, to do the work I know I need to do. And um, that always puzzles me still because I'm thinking, firstly, the very phrase, I'm mo- how do I motivate myself? I'm going... I'm sorry, who's going to do the motivating? You are. Why don't you forget about the you that you're trying to motivate and just talk to the one who's going to do the motivating? They're obviously already motivated because they want to motivate you. Like, who is this speaking to me now? You say, can you help me motivate myself? And I go, who's asking? Because that guy definitely wants to do this. Like, And who is the person we're talking about who who you're having trouble getting to do it? And it's like this duality. And I, I know there's a whole realm we could go into about the duality of, of you know of, of human beings and mm-hmm. how we are like that people say i'm disappointed with myself i'm proud of myself and you go who's proud and who are you proud of you know we do have this duality but nonetheless when it comes to music like this to me that always points out something and this is how i deal with that i say to them i think you're forgetting why you're doing this if you're needing to sit here and say can you help me motivate myself to make great music and that's they say oh no i'm asking you to help me motivate myself do the work and i'm going same thing same thing. Yeah. That's what's happening. You've forgotten why you're doing this. You're not, or you're not present, even if you haven't forgotten with why you're doing it. I said, you're focusing on, I got to learn these modes and it's becoming a bit of a drag. And so I'm becoming, you know, unmotivated. And I want you to help me with that. And I say to them, no one wants to hear modes. This is not why you're a musician. No wonder it's starting to become a drag. You're too focused on the process or on, you know, you're making that what you're doing. That's not what you're doing. You're becoming a better musician so you can make music, so you can make the world different. I mean, I like to go, let's go straight to the end game. I mean, music makes the world better. Some people would say it makes it bearable. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, it's an expression of human beings that's like no other. And, and what it can do for and to people is incredible. You remember that and all of a sudden you're almost embarrassed to say, oh, I'm, I'm having trouble doing my emoji or what, what you know. It's like it's like someone says you got a chance to save the world, but you have to pick up that box. You all it's kind of heavy, you know. Yeah. You'd be embarrassed to say that. You just right. go and pick it up. Right. And so I talk to them like that and say, "Remember what music's like." And then what we do is we listen to some music or we play some music. We experience that amazing magic that happens when music touches you. And I go, "That was awesome." You know, what would make it better if you knew your modes, <laughs> and they run out of the room to practice them. 
Right. You know, I don't want to motivate you to make yourself do something you don't really want to do. I want to make it that you can't wait to do it. And, and for me, the work part of it never was. Oh, I, if, you, if we could turn back time and had a secret camera, we'd find me sitting there playing the horn and building up chops and doing all that stuff. But I was never sitting there to build up chops or to learn to play or to get better, you know, faster on playing the horn or more facility or anything. I was sitting there always because I wanted to make music. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there was just how you did it. Yeah. You know, and, and uh, I guess, I guess one final anal an analogy I, I used like that is if you were watching Michelangelo, you know, carve the statue of David, you know, one of the most famous works of art in human history. Um, if you walked up to him and said, what are you doing right now? If he was in the middle of it, imagine if he said, I mean, he, he should say, I imagine what he was saying is I'm creating a work of art. I'm, I'm, I'm removing the material here so you can see the play of light on this shape. Well, would you be disappointed if he said, well, I'm holding a hammer and I'm bashing the end of this chisel. Yeah. Like that was physically what he was doing, but that's not what he was doing. And we're never practicing scales. We're doing what we need to do to create something. And so I, I think that, um, that that covers the work side of it. But notice how that comes from the inspiration. And you know what? I have no idea what the other thing is, what makes some people just able to do this and others, you know, have a lot more trouble with it. But um, I reckon there's a, there, there are too many that I've struck people there who have the ability to do this and don't always pursue it you know, to the extent that they could and with the passion they could and, and make it happen. And I do believe it's because partly, and I'm not like letting them off the hook, the way we teach it too, you know. If I if all I ever talk to them about is, have you learned that scale? Have you learned that mode? Have you learned that head? Can you do that in every key? And that's all I ever say as a teacher. Even though that's necessary, then no wonder they end up thinking that's what it's all about. You know, I, th I think you've got to connect all the time and every day, remember why you do it. And every time I'm in front of a student, no matter what else we talk about, even if I just mention it before they leave the room, we have a moment where we, we touch on music and remember what it's about and why we do it always. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's that ultimate expression um, of your intent and your desire to, to, to express an emotion, a thought, a feeling uh, internally. Yep. Uh, express it in an external way and have it uh, replicated in others. I mean, whether it's, uh, you know, playing an instrument, whether it's like you're saying uh, uh, a, a great a sculpture or a great piece of mm. visual art, it's all the same. That's the, the artist's yeah. desire. And I think we, we spend so much time uh, focusing on the technical aspect of things that we lose sight of. This is just a way of creating an emotional connection. And uh, my, uh, you know, for almost a quarter century, uh, I was a professional martial arts instructor. And, and uh, that was one of the big things that uh, one of my teachers would say is like, you know, when you when you are doing movement, you you are expressing an emotion, you're expressing an idea. And it doesn't have to be technically as solid if the feeling is right, if your intention yeah. is correct. Uh, it's like guys, uh, it, what the analogy gave is like giving a kiss. So if you are going to give someone a kiss and you're worried about how much moisture you have on your lip and how much tension is on your, your bottom lip and how much pressure you're <laughs> applying, it's not going to be a very good kiss. But if it's, even if it's sloppy and you, you only get half of a lip in there, but you do it with feeling and passion, the per other person knows what you're trying to express. Yeah. Yep. So, so, and I think we're, as trumpet players, particularly, we we get so obsessed with uh, the technical aspect of things, and you know, we started to get into the gear stuff. That that that's a complete rabbit hole that we can go down. <laughs> but um, well, you know, but on, on that side, on the technical side, I, I'd like to touch on one thing, not on gear, um, but just on the idea of trumpets of what. You know, it, it does draw you into that if you're not careful. Like it's it's something to be aware of as a trumpeter that this instrument is physically demanding. And, um, you know, I play a lot of instruments, so I can say with some authority that, uh, you know, if, if you leave the trumpet in the case for a period of time, it'll, it'll kick you when you take it out again. And I'm not saying any instrument is any easier than the trumpet. They all have their challenges. But I can tell you there's a number of instruments I play if I spend the same amount of time away from them, they won't hurt me at all. 
physically. You know, they'll say, welcome back. You know, yeah. um, I kind of imagine, I, I want to share this with you, I imagine the instruments have these personalities and they say things to you. You know, you pick up a trumpet and if you haven't played it for a while, it says, oh, you've been away. I'm going to hurt you. You know, <laughs> um, there are some worse instruments. You don't play the French horn for a while and you come back to that. Man, it'll say to you, it'll say you didn't call, you didn't write. You think you're just going to walk in here and play me? You're not going to get anything, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and then there are instruments that are really friendly and say, welcome back. You know, yeah, let's make some music. And uh, it's that's just on the physical plane I'm talking, you know. Right. And so trumpet, because it's like that, you know, I understand why trumpeters as a breed do tend to very quickly start talking about technical things because it is a physical instrument. But one of the things I do to to um, ameliorate that and actually probably a lot of the time eliminate it is how I think about it. Firstly, um, I just completely have disregard for that side of it and go, sorry, it's not about you. When the trumpet, I go, we're going to make. And I very much, I watch trumpeters and sometimes it's a thing we can get into where we start to have a battle with the instrument, like fight it. And I always enlist it as an ally. And I'm just talking about an attitude now when I pick it up. It's like, we're going to make music together, not you better work or I'm going to be in trouble, like, or I'm going to, I'm going to get mad or I'm going to whatever, you know. It's work with me here. Let's do this together. And the other thing is a really simple little visualization I have. You watch a trumpeter when they go to play high. And we all know that range is one of those things on trumpet too that's particularly taxing and, and a thing that gets talked about a lot. They'll often raise their eyebrows or look up or do all sorts of things when they go to play a high note um, because they we do tend to think of it. I mean, high, even the word high is up, right? Low mm -hmm. is down. High is harder. Try, you know, try lifting your arms up. It's harder than putting everything about that word, about the thought that is up there, makes it harder. So all I do, and maybe it comes from being a pianist as well, but I turn it on its side. And in mm. my mind, the high notes are over on the right and the low notes are on the left. And you've never seen a piano player go, I'm going to go for a high note now and then start going, oh, and struggle. And as they put their hand over the right, they go, it's just over here. They're no harder to reach than the low ones. <laughs> And right. because in my mind, when I play higher on the trumpet, I'm moving to the right rather than up. I do notice there's a difference. Like it's it's just there's something in you that doesn't tense up and doesn't tell you this is going to be hard. Now, that's not to say the air doesn't have to accelerate and all those physical things don't have to happen. But at least you don't have to make it mentally hard. Because right. uh, guess what? And here's something we don't tell non-trumpeters. Trumpet's not that mentally difficult. I mean, I know I, I say it as a gag. It's only got three buttons. How hard could it be? You know, yeah. but man, physically it's taxing. And um, you know, I explain sometimes to students that there's a difference between the word hard and difficult. Mm -hmm. Digging a ditch is hard. Like you'll sweat, you'll get blisters on your hand, but it's not difficult. You just stick the the shovel in and tip it over all the time. Right. You know, programming a computer that's difficult. It's not hard. You just sit at a desk in a chair, no sweat but it's difficult. Right. Trumpet is hard, not difficult. It's hard work, but it's not difficult. I mean, you blow through the hole and move your fingers up and down on the buttons, you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, I can just hear some of the comments about that. Yeah, you, uh, you, 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 just, you just blew it for me, James. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not difficult, but yeah. we can make it seem difficult by how we think about it. Exactly. Really, it's just about airstream and accelerating it, slowing it down. Like, can, you know, it's, it's, there's nothing particularly technically difficult about this, but it is hard work and, and you can make it seem difficult. And as I say, if you focus on the sound you want to make, if you focus on what the emotion of the sound, go past the sound and go to what you're trying to do with it, the instrument I find falls into line very quickly because it becomes part of something much bigger than, you know, blowing through a pipe and doing something technical. Right, right. Yeah, that's that's really great. I love that. I love that. Um, and you were you were talking about you know being a multi instrumentalist, and I, I actually want to touch on that um, the mindset of a multi instrumentalist. Um, so uh, I remember I was having a, uh, a trumpet lesson with a, a player from uh, DC was with the uh, the airman I know his name is Vaughn Nark. So Vaughn mm -hmm. Vaughn was uh, teaching me for a while, and, and and he said to me because he plays. You know, you play trumpet, you play euphonium, valve trombone, things like that. And he'd say, you know, you, you kind of have to hear in your head the sound that you want. And that was what, for him, determined which instrument he wanted to pick up. It's like, okay, well, on this song, I really kind of hear 
in this range. Mm-hmm. So that's I'll play trumpet, I'll play flugelhorn on this, I'll play you know euphonium on this. So uh, as a multi instrumentalist, who's not only going through different registers, but also you're getting a completely different uh, sound quality uh, when you're playing on a saxophone, than when you're playing on a trombone, when you're playing on a trumpet. Do you have a, a mental shift that goes on? Do you have a different approach to them? Do you pick an instrument based on on something uh, innate, or is it just, hey, I just want to play saxophone on this one? Well, it's, it's interesting because the answer is 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 yes and no and it's equally both depending on how you look at it and it's like this absolutely they're all different they all have their own characters they've all got you know of course there are different technical aspects to them too but um but certainly they have different sounds and they suit different things in my mind but and that makes it sound like a big choice and there's lots going on but in actual fact it's the simplest thing in the world because my reason for picking up any instrument at any time is always the same and it's just I hear some music, I want to play it, you know, and and whatever I feel is going to express my emotion best. Like when I, when I when I say right now I'm going to play a song, you name a song, I'll immediately imagine it in my mind like anybody, any musician would, but it'll be on an instrument. And whatever that one is, that's the one I'm picking up or sitting at next because that's how I heard it. So in other words, there is no shift in that sense that the purpose is always the same. And, and the, the reason for the choice is always the same. Once I'm sitting at the piano or holding a saxophone or holding a trombone, sure, there's some other stuff that takes place. And you certainly don't try and play the same things on, on different instruments. You know, um, it's, yeah, they, they lend themselves to different things. But, uh, yeah, it's all just what's the best expression at the moment of what I'm trying to do. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, and you had mentioned earlier that uh, you have uh, your, your own uh, school. Uh, James yep. Morrison Academy of Music, and when I when I found that out, I was really really um, impressed, amazed, and you know, on top of all this, it, this seems to be the theme in your life is let's add one more thing to our <laughs> plate. <laughs> um, but uh, to to not only just be passionate about education and, and about helping people to become uh, better musicians, better better creative souls. Uh, but to do that by having an actual school that people can travel at uh, or, or study at. So what was the impetus for you starting the, the academy and, and kind of what's, what's the driving force behind that? Um, I've, I've been teaching all my life, and um, that's mainly consisted for, for quite some time now. Once I started you know, touring a lot and being on the road, like from, well, virtually from my late teens, that's always consisted of visiting places and teaching. So it's always short term. You come somewhere, you do a, a workshop or a masterclass. Maybe someone asks you for a lesson when you're passing through towns, so you give someone a lesson. And uh, if you're really lucky, you might get to see them twice if you're somewhere for a while. And that's it. Then you move on and you're seeing other people. And that was one thing. The other thing was I visited a lot of institutions. And you see some great things. You go, wow, that's awesome. And you see other things in schools and as well-meaning as they all were, because I, I think anyone who's in education is just awesome. But sometimes you think, you go, now, if I had a school, I'd do it like this. And you end up with this after years, you end up with a great long list of if I had a school. Yeah. <laughs> right. I'm the sort of person that has to then have a school because I, I, you know, I can't, I got to put my money where my mouth is. I can't keep saying stuff like that, even if it's just internally and then not do it. Right. So I guess there's two things. One was I wanted to put into practice all the things that I thought would make a great school, having visited so many schools. And the other thing was I just wanted to spend more than an hour with some musicians. I wanted to spend three years with them and say, come and do a bachelor degree, spend three years. Let's go on the journey for a little while. It's still only a small part of their life. It's only a small part of their musical journey, but it's a lot better than an hour. You know, I wanted to say, let's talk about something. Let's get something going. And then I'll see you again tomorrow. And for a few years, so we really get to have a journey. And, and I really wanted to do that and have a deeper sort of uh, role play in people's musical journeys than just arriving, giving a workshop, and then and then going to the next town. So, yeah, so I started a school about so what, seven years ago. Oh, so, I mean, that had to be uh, a tremendous undertaking uh, in terms of the things that they had to go through to, to have it accredited. Uh, to, you know, establishing faculty, establishing curriculum, things like that. Um, and, you know, the ongoing input of energy that, that has to be a part of that. Um, so when, when you were 
in this, did you ever have those moments where you're like, what the hell did I get myself into? Or, you know, did, did that, that passion of creating this next generation or helping to nurture this next generation of musicians, did, did that, that keep you going through the process? Well, it's both. I mean, about four minutes in, I said, what are we doing? <laughs> like, whose idea was this? But as you say, the passion for go, yeah, well, nonetheless, that's just a challenge that's been thrown up. And there are lots of challenges and have always been and continue to be. But certainly at the beginning, setting it up, yeah, there's once you, you, I had this idea having a school means just teaching people music, right? And then, yeah, the whole thing, not just faculty and curriculum, but all the administrative side to that and everything that has to be right around that and all the policies and procedures and like you name it and so um it was i'm not a uh, what do they call them a control freak but at the same time uh, I'm, I'm a responsibility person and by that i mean if it's my school i can just hire someone to write policies and procedures but i'm going to have to read through them all and make sure they fit with my idea of what's what's needed and what's going to be right and what's going to work um, to realise the vision. I'm a great believer when a person has a vision, they need to follow it through. And uh, by all means, get help from all sorts of people, but you've really got to be, you know, you've got to, you've got to experience all of it yourself. And it's a big job. It's a huge job. So, um, yeah, so sometimes it was a nightmare, you know. Um, but um, it's, uh, it, it's the same as playing the horn, those days when students say, I don't want to learn these scales, you know, you go, uh, what's it for? And when you thought about, yeah, but we're going to get to sit there with these young musicians and like pass this on and have this incredible experience. And I'm really lucky. I've got great faculty and all of them do talk about that all the time. We go, wow, we actually get to like spend this time with these people and pass this on. It's, it's, it's extremely fulfilling. Yeah. That's I, again, that, that's such a tremendous undertaking and uh, it has to be rewarding and it has to be, frustrating and it has to it, so there's this gamut yeah, of emotions with all of those things yeah. <laughs> yeah so it but but that's life you know and i i think yeah. sometimes we we, we want to play it safe we don't want to uh deal with the hardships and the the pains and the struggles but that's part of the human condition and i think to me it the the things that that have brought me ultimately the most joy in life are because of some of the difficulties that i've had to go through because it just Absolutely. made me appreciate it yeah so that that's wow. I was shown a great thing and I've shown it. I have three kids, three boys. I mean, they're all in their 20s now. They're growing up. But but um, I showed it to them. It was shown to me. Uh, just a great life lesson. I, I got a candle and lit it, you know, one night in a dark room. And it's magical. I mean, what human being doesn't look at a candle in a dark room and just stare at the flame? And it's just it's beautiful. And that was it. They went to sleep. And then I said, we're going to do that again in the morning. And in the morning, we went outside and we actually went out in the sunlight it was bright sunlight and i lit the candle and i said how's it look now and they said well yeah gee it's weird it looks so much better last night and i said that's because it was surrounded by darkness on a sunny day it's hard for a candle to be you know to be so mesmerizing and i said you know when because they they'd been sad about something they had a, a pet that died and i said without without the darkness around the light that you can't see the light yeah. And, uh, you know, the ups and downs. The, and and how, how could you have the satisfaction of seeing someone graduate and how much that means to you when they, when, and when the lights come on, I call it when the lights come on, when someone gets something, that, some concept, some musical thing, that wouldn't be so amazing, so wonderful, so fulfilling if there weren't all the times when they don't or when you've got more administrative work to do, when it's a drag. That's what makes that great. You know, right. it's, 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 as you say, it's life. Without the struggle, there is no triumph. Yeah, exactly. That's that's great, and you know, it's so great to hear um, hear that. Not just reiter reiterated in terms of our conversation, but that seems to be a, a huge theme for you in terms of the approach that you take towards uh, your your teaching and your music as well. So, uh, you know, helping people to understand that, you know, it's. If, if you if you define it as a struggle and the struggle is a bad thing, then it is a bad thing. It's getting it's allowing your head to get in the way yeah. when you accept it as being part of the process. You know, I, I used to tell my students the the more frustrated you get when you're trying to learn a, a new mechanical concept, uh, a new level of coordination, the more frustrated you get. That's actually the closer you're getting to the, the inevitable solution because your, your brain and your body are trying to create new 
uh, neural pathways and, and new uh, synapses and all this is going on under the, the hood and the, the stronger the struggle, that means that you're ready, you're getting ready to make that change. And yeah. you just have to, to get through that because once you get through that, once you understand that the more frustrated you get, you know, like for me, I get excited when I get frustrated because it's like, I'm, I'm about to get this, you know, it, it mm-hmm. may be, it may be the next time it may be 10 times. I don't know, but I'm, I'm getting there. I'm on the cusp of, of a breakthrough. Uh, and when you can do that, you create this mind shift and you, for lack of a better word, you embrace the struggle and you understand that it's just that inevitable part of the process. But it's just every time you do it, you're one step closer to your, your ultimate desire. So uh, when you're working with with uh, with these young students, um, you know, you obviously are going to have to help them to create these shifts because uh, our current educational systems uh, don't particularly embrace that concept. Uh, do you, do you find, uh, that you have to, to have developed a bag of tricks, so to speak, uh, to help break through some of the, the mental barriers that, that, uh, most of us are programmed with? Look, I definitely spend as much time, if not more, um, doing that work than actually stuff about how to play the trumpet or any other instrument. I find the main work, particularly at that, I must say at that level, it might be different if I was teaching, you know, elementary school, but but at a college level, most of the work I find is about the mental side and is about, you know, it's, it's a lot of life lessons and, and how to deal with things. Because uh, by that stage, you know, get to university for a musician, they can all play their instruments. They've got challenges, of course, physically still to overcome and things to learn, but yeah, it's a lot about it's a lot more about that than it is about any mechanics or any um, you know particular techniques. And um, I sometimes wonder if I'm running a music school or a therapy session. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, because the 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 process of learning is a mental thing. Uh, yeah. You know, it it's you got to you got to get into that and and what is the thinking that is restricting the ability to express the ideas because the idea is already there. You know, mm. our, our ideas are there, our, our intentions are there, our emotions are there. It's just how do we get them out? And it's, it's getting, uh, I, I've used the analogy for some people saying you, you need to get your head out of the way so that your heart can speak. You well, know? absolutely. And, you know, when you said what is the thinking that's getting in the way, my mind just immediately said all of it. <laughs> All thinking is getting in. Any thinking at all is getting in the way. Um, there is nothing you can think when you're actually really making great music. When you're playing well, whether you're playing technically well or creatively well or both, or what it matter. When it's on, when that music is happening, every time if you if you notice, you'll notice you're not thinking, you're feeling and expressing. And um, yeah, so I, that's as you say. To, and we have all those ways of saying get your head out of the way or get out of your head or all those sorts of things. But yeah. And I think there's a, a good technique there too um, that I use often. You know, it's the, you've heard that uh, thing where they say, think of anything but a blue elephant. You right. know, and of course, that you can't because someone just said it. Um, and so it's what, you know, to say, say to people, you've got to try and get out of your head or stop thinking, of course, doesn't work at all because then they think about not thinking. Right. Um, and so I, I use a, a, a thing that's, that's, you know, very tried and proven and, and almost, you know, so simple and so obvious that it's hard, it's hardly worth mentioning. And yet, if you went for a tennis lesson, one of the things that every tennis coach on earth is going to say, particularly if you're beginning in the center, keep your eye on the ball. They always say, keep your eye on the ball. I've heard it a million times. I've seen it. I'm going, when you think about that objectively for a sec, what a weird thing to say. Like someone's standing on a tennis court and someone's hitting a ball towards them. Where else were they going to look? You know, of course they're going to look. Like, what right. else could you be looking at but right. the ball if someone's hitting a ball towards you? And yet they always say, keep your eye on the ball, keep your eye on the ball. And you think, why are they saying that? And it's because they're not saying, make sure you hold the racket like this, move your arm back when it comes, put your feet here. It's like, I'm going to give you something really simple to do. And it's focusing on what the object is, what this is all about. That ball's coming. Just watch that. Your subconscious will work out when to move your feet and how to get there in time and all that. If you ask someone, even the world's greatest tennis player, when do you have to start running from here to get to there? By the time the ball gets there, they wouldn't have a clue. They just do it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they couldn't, if, they, if you ask them how many seconds, how many milliseconds, they wouldn't have any idea. How fast do you need to move your racket back? Wouldn't know. But I'll show it to you. 
And of course, a great tennis player will get it right every time. And it's the same playing the horn. It's the same making music. Um, you know, no trumpeter knows what airspeed is required for a G on top of the stave, but they can all play one. But if you said, what's the velocity of the air there? Well, it depends on your lip tension. Okay, what tension? How many Newton meters is it? Or whatever, measure it for me. You couldn't play like that. We don't need to know. We just need to know it sounds like this. And if I hear that sound in my head and I go to blow, I'll just do all the right things and it'll come out, you know. And I find most of the time one problem doesn't always come out for me. I, I miss the notes sometimes. I, I swear 99.9% of the times if you miss a note, it's nothing to do with your lips or your air or anything. It's because you're not hearing the note first. It's not in your head strong enough. What you're about to do is not clear enough. Because if it is and you're capable of doing it, then your body will do it. And um, I find that uh, I ask people, did you hear that note in your head? And they go, yeah. And I said, what did it sound like? And they go, what do you mean what did it sound like? It was a G. And I go, no, but what did it sound like? And they go, oh, it just sounds like a G. And I go, well, what instrument was it? And they go, well, it wasn't an instrument. It's just a G. And I go, well, you're playing a trumpet. So it needs to be a trumpet that's playing the G in your head, not just a tone. And guess what? Not a trumpet, your trumpet in this room, how it sounds here. And the more accurate what you hear is to what's about to happen, the more certain you are of getting it. And if you actually hear it so that when it comes out, they blend, there's no difference. Like there's no surprise at all. You're not going to ever miss a note. God, that's deep. I love that one. I love that one. <laughs> yeah, man. Um, so when, when you think about like the, this concept, like, um, like metacognition, so our, mm -hmm. our awareness, our ability to, to think about our thinking. Um, like for me, uh, playing, when, when I feel my best at playing, it's because I'm, I'm aware of what's going on, but I'm not focused on what's going on. It's, yep. it's just, you know, it, it's almost a, an out-of-body experience where, where I'm kind of seeing myself from, from an external point of view. Yep. Um, and I, th I think sometimes it's so hard for us to get, uh, we get pulled in by what occurs. So, you know, we miss a note uh, or we have a, a passage that's given us difficulty in the past. And, and so we start to either get stuck in, in a past thing where, where we're thinking about what happened in the past or we start to worry about what might happen in the future. And we, we can't actually then function in the present moment. Um in terms of the way that you, you are coaching your students, uh, and I'm, I'm using that term coach, uh, meaning, you know, to, to lead them or guide them. I think sometimes we, we misunderstand the concept of the role of a, of a instructor or a teacher. Uh, you know, uh, I think that our job is to, uh, to guide people, you know, not, not necessarily mm -hmm. tell them what to do, but, but guide them and give them, uh, our insights and help them to, to find the, the answers within themselves. But when you're, when you're coaching someone through that kind of a process, um, you know, how do you, how do you explain to someone ways that they can, uh, bring themselves into that moment and, and let go of the judgment that, that sometimes creeps in, in our performance that we do need in practice where, where we need to be able to say, well, you know, Hey, you know, you need to, to tighten this up. You need to, you know, really work mm -hmm. on this. Uh, but how do you, how do you help them to come to that space for performance sake? It is the keep your eye on the ball thing. It is to say you're not here to play the trumpet. You know, playing the trumpet is a stepping stone. It's a means to an end. And um, it's the same thing. I mean, you can take this at all levels. We start at the most basic level. You know, kids sometimes blow into the trumpet. And I go, you don't blow into this. It's not a bucket. It's a pipe with another end. You blow through the trumpet. You know, so I want you to stand on the stage and play towards the back of the room straight from you. And the trumpet just happens to be in the way. Like it's got to go through it first, you know, but it's, it's, it's not into the trumpet. You're not blowing the trumpet. You're blowing through the trumpet. That's the first thing. And then we go, let's take that concept even further. You're not even blowing through the trumpet. You're making a trumpet sound. You happen to be holding a trumpet while you're doing it, but that's the sound you're making. You go, okay, let's go further than the sound. You're creating that emotion that that sound makes. And we usually stop there. And I go one step further and say, you're not creating that emotion. You're experiencing that. And you're inviting everyone else in the room to experience it with you. You're just manifesting it. 
the sound exists whether you play or not. Right now, any sound that could be played is right there. And if you picked up a trumpet now or I did, all we'd do is make it audible. If I don't play, you know, a, a, a B on the trumpet right now, B on the trumpet still exists, right? You know what I right, mean? Right. Like every note does. And an analogy would be there are radio stations passing through both of us now while we talk. There's classical stations and, and hip-hop and R&B and everything. We can't hear any of them. But if we got a radio and tuned it into the right station, it would appear to someone from a couple of hundred years ago who didn't understand radio that music suddenly got created. And you go, no, it was always there. All music is always there. We just can't hear it. But when you tune in, that's the one you hear. And so all I'm really doing is saying all these sounds are always there. And at the moment, the one I'm manifesting that expresses me is this one. And that takes it away from I'm not even playing the trumpet. I'm not even creating an emotion. The emotion's already there. I'm just manifesting it. And um, what that does is it's so far from where do I have to put my tongue or how much air do I need or what's the fingering here or is this tricky, a bit tricky, that that, there's so much momentum in that. I'm a, I'm a great believer in this idea that the energy of that is so strong, it will drag you and your body and your chops that are a bit wasted, kicking and screaming, they'll just do it. It's too big a thing for them to resist. And so ideas like, oh, I'm a bit tired now, it's towards the end of the year, I hope I get there, such and such. That idea is not worthy of this job. Like it's you know, we're, we're, we're operating on a much higher order than that. And that's just going to be subservient to it, as opposed to the trumpeter who's sitting there. And the biggest thing in their being, when there's one song to go on the big band gig and they're playing lead is, man, my chops are wasted. And that is the biggest thing. I just got to get these notes. And they're determined and they're putting their energy and they're giving it their all. And we go, that's awesome. No, it's not. It's too small a job. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's not really what's happening. Why are you even playing these notes? Because oh, it feels awesome. Keep going. Because that makes everyone else feel that. And you go, now we're getting closer. Now how does the job look? It's just a tiny component. And suddenly you get to use everything you've got. And not just what you've got, what's coming through you. And, uh, you know, I, I, I want to give you a picture of that in, in your mind and for everyone who's listening in their minds that I give my students. I say to them, have you ever seen what happens if they get a diamond and you can look at if you don't have a diamond and we all not i don't but if, if you do then look up you can see it on, on online you can see it online you get a diamond and you hold it in sunlight now sunlight coming through the window looks great what color is it so it doesn't really have a color i mean i suppose it's kind of white but it's not because if it was you wouldn't be able to see through it, it doesn't even have a color you go okay it's just light now put a diamond in the window and let the sunlight hit it and put a, a piece of paper behind it bright magenta, blue, purple, yellow, these incredible colours. You go, wow, look at the colours in that diamond. Wrong. There are no colours in a diamond. They're all the colours that are in the sunlight, but you can't see them until you put them through a diamond. Check out a diamond in a dark room. It's just a rock. Check out sunlight without the diamond. Everything's there, which means you can't see anything because we're humans. When everything's there, we can't see anything. Put a diamond there. And it splits the colours and you can see them and they're amazing. A musician is a diamond. The sunlight is the music. You don't have to create the colours. They come through you and certain ones then are amplified and certain sounds, certain things you hear, that's what everyone experiences. And when you're practising, you're not creating music, you're polishing the diamond. Ah. You, know, you get brighter colours. I love and, and it. And that it just gives you this feeling the music comes through you and you're expressing something that is there whether you do it or not. But when you do it, it's your expression of it, you know, because every diamond shines different colours in different ways. Mm -hmm. And um, But it becomes so much more amazing once the musician is in the room. There's music in every room. You just can't hear it until a musician walks in. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Yeah, and that, that puts a really good spin on the practice concept. Uh, when, oh, yeah. you, when you say, you know, that you're polishing the diamond, um, you know, it's just like if you're, if you're polishing your horn, you know, so, you know, yeah. especially if you've got a nice, beautiful, you know, shiny horn and you want to keep it shiny. So <laughs> you, you relish that process yeah. or if you, you, know, you get a new car and you want to keep the car nice and shiny. Um, so it becomes an enjoyable process as opposed to, oh crap, I've got to go out and wash the car again, or I've got to go, you know, polish my trumpet. So that little mind shift, I can see how that would, uh, change that practice that that practice 
uh, approach and by changing the, the, the mental state that you're in as you're going into it, when you're, when you're thinking, oh, this is going to suck, well, it's going to suck. But when you're thinking, man, I'm, I'm getting to polish my diamond, then yeah. it becomes an enjoyable process and it's, it's play still, you know? And, and of course, to go on from there, like that final step, as you said, about performing and playing, I mean, pushing the dog is then becomes enjoyable and becomes satisfying. How great is it when you're done and you go, now I'm going to hold it up to the light? You know, that moment where you say, I've just been polishing it, now I'm going to hold it up to the light and see what comes from I mean, that's the moment. That's walking onto the stage. That's, that's, that's the counting. You go, now we hold it up to the light and see what comes through. I mean, that's like... That's better than I don't know what I don't even I don't even words the words have stopped and that you you can tell by so far this uh, this chat we're having I'm not usually lost for words <laughs> but I don't even know what to say about that everyone just knows that feeling you hold it up to the light the sunlight comes through and you go wow that's it yeah and it's that moment when you feel that connection and you know for lack of a better word uh, it's a spiritual thing that yes. that you feel the connection with something that is so profound and so much larger than you as you're saying that the music exists without us uh we're just filtering it we're just we're just allowing it to come through us and amplifying it through the, the instrument so mm -hmm. when you have those moments uh there's just man there's just nothing like it and uh you know but you can't experience that when your head's in the way so no no yeah well you contrast you know that that with yes yeah, someone who's thinking about the just thinking about it rather than actually being it yeah yeah, yeah that, it's a whole different thing. That's awesome. Uh, and you know, you've got you've got the school going on. I know you've you've also got a studio that that you've uh -huh. you've designed down there. Um, uh, and uh, obviously, yeah, we were connected by uh, my friend, our, our mutual friend, uh, Willie Murillo. And you've done some stuff with Willie with the the, the practice app. Uh, so uh -huh. you're just you're you're all over the place, man. You know, you're recording. You're uh, I, I'm not sure what, what's going on down in Australia these days in terms of uh, the ability to do live gigs, whether that's opened up uh, yet or not. We're slowly opening up here in the States. Um, but, um, you know, how do you balance all of these things that you're that you're doing? Um, it's interesting about the balance word. Um, all I can say is that whatever I'm doing that's what I'm doing. I think people look at what sometimes I'm doing or someone, you know, other people, you know, that, that do a lot of things and they go, where, where do you find all the energy or where do you find the time or how do you do all those things? And I go, it's actually easy because I'm never not doing what I'm doing. And I, I have to, I should quickly explain that most of the time I find a lot of people uh, whilst they're doing something, they're also doing a whole lot of other things in their mind. They're getting ready for what they're going to do. They're thinking about what they have done. I mean, even within playing a piece on the trumpet, you can be trying to play this bar, but you're thinking about when you screwed up three bars ago or how well it went three bars. It doesn't matter, but you're thinking about it. You're thinking about when we get to letter G, you know, yeah. be present with the bar you play now. If all you were doing was playing the bar you're playing now, you got so much spare energy or, or you can put it all into that bar if needs be. So whatever I'm doing, that's all I'm doing. And that means you can do lots of things. I mean, look, a ca case in point, I'm sitting here now. It's like it's, 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 it's quarter to two in the morning. Um, I'm in Adelaide in South Australia. Uh, tomorrow I'm driving. I'm, I'm also a professional driver. I'm, I'm in a, a race tomorrow. I'm driving for McLaren. I mean, Whoa. you know, McLaren, the, the, yeah. the, the race car manufacturer. Yeah. How do you fit that in? Because that's all I'll be doing. Trust me, when you're in a McLaren at speed, you don't want to be thinking about what you're going to play on the gig that night. You want to be doing what you're doing. I fly planes. I fly my band around. I have a, you know, an aircraft. It's, it's, you can do almost any number of things because guess what? No matter how many you do, you're only ever doing one, same as everybody else. Right. It's just that's all you're doing. And so you can do many different things because you can give, if you give anything, your complete attention and you're completely present there and you're not thinking about it that's the other thing it doesn't matter what i'm doing driving a car playing a trumpet flying a plane doesn't matter what it is i employ that same that same way of approaching it don't think about it actually be present with it and man you can you can do a lot of things mm -hmm. um in fact i i still know i'm intrinsically lazy 
and I'm comfortable with that. I, yeah. I like to take it easy. Um, it's it's my it's how I am with things, and yet doesn't mean you can't do lots of things. Yeah. So yeah, uh, yeah. but it's I, I think it would be a great thing. I try and pass that on to any student. I try and pass it on to anyone I can. If you actually are fully present right now with what you're doing, you'd be amazed at what you can do. Yeah. Well, you know, you, you, you and I are very similar in, in this respect. Uh, you know, I understand that I'm inherently lazy and that's one of the reasons I keep my, <laughs> I, I keep myself busy because I know that if mm-hmm. I allow myself to slow down and stop, it's going to be really hard for me oh, to get my, my butt moving again. So but, I empathize with that completely. Yeah. But, you know, I do so many different things. And for a long period of time, I felt like I was dividing my energies and that, you know, from the outside, it kind of looks like, you know, nothing, you know, it's just a bunch of random stuff going on. But as I've gotten older uh, and am able to look at things, I've understood how everything is working towards my, my deeper why. Yep. And then, and, and the, the, the impact that I want to make and the life that I want to live. So whether it be my music or my mindfulness work or my consulting work, or even this podcast, everything is in service of that deeper why that I have of just trying to make the world a better place and helping to people and helping people understand yep. how what's going on between their ears is what's really creating, you know, kind of shaping their reality. So, yeah. uh, you know, so this is all working together towards that, that one expression of, of who I am. So I think that that's really crucial for people to, to kind of uh, be able to step back kind of that metacognition thing of looking at their life and lives and, and saying, well, are these all in service of, you know, moving me towards the point that I want to be? Uh, and if it is fantastic, be all in, if it's not, then maybe reconsider you know, your, your approach or, or what you're doing, if it's not getting you to, yeah. to where you want to be. So, um, so I want to be, you know, very, very, uh, you know, aware of your time. And, uh, you know, I, man, I could talk to you forever. I have the feeling you know, because, <laughs> you know, we could, we could go down some, some, some wicked rabbit holes in terms of, of mindset and, and things like that. But, uh, I have two, two segments and I, I need to get to, uh, because these mm-hmm. are, these are standards here. Uh, the first one, you got to talk gear. My gosh, you know, mm-hmm. I, I, I would be, you know, I would be ostracized from the trumpet community if I didn't talk gear at least once. So I have a segment of the show called Gear It Up. But uh, with Gear Up, uh, you know, I want to talk about what you're playing. But also I want to, uh, you know, get into that more mental aspect into the the why. Why why do you have the gear that you have? And, and yep. you know, what are, are some of the, the suggestions that you would give to, you know, players that are looking to change their setups? Uh, you know, what are the things that they wanted to think about in terms of, uh, you know, the, their approach to the gear that they use yeah i think the main thing for me in gear is and gears gears important gears important and i have gear that i like to use absolutely and um i don't want to play anything else um but it's 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 the why of that and the attitude to that is this i don't look to the gear to give me something you know uh, i people say things what kind of sound does that horn have I love to just hold the horn up and go, I don't know, it doesn't seem to have any sound at all. <laughs> you know, yeah. no horn has a sound. Um, but but what I the way I, I treat the choice of gear and how you make decisions about what to play, whether it be all the aspects of your trumpet, you know, the the the, the of course the make, the model, the finish, the bell side, everything about it, all these choices, lead pipe, uh, you know, and then the mouthpiece, man, go on there for years about mouthpieces. The thing is it's it all has an effect, it's all important. But the effect I'm looking for is what makes it easiest, what wants to make the sound. So we know, for instance, if we get a, a certain bell on a trumpet, it'll want to be brighter, is the way I put it, than another one that wants to be darker. Now, I can make the dark one sound bright and I can make the bright one sound darker. No problem at all. The thing is I'll have to work at it because I'm trying to make that metal do something it doesn't naturally want to do. Right. So I don't choose the brighter bell to give me a brighter sound. I have a brighter sound. I rebel, fight me. So we're working together. So that it's easier for me to do what I'm going to do anyway. And if you give me a horrible trumpet, by that I mean, you know, like some real, like old student model from I don't know when student models weren't good. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'll I'll play on it, and unless I tell you, most people in the room aren't going to notice the difference. But man, will I notice the difference? Right. Like, 
it'll be horrible, <laughs> um, a horrible experience. I'll be working like crazy. Um, and then give me my horn. I play a shargle, um, and it's a signature model. It's a James Morrison Meister horn, they call it, and all that that I've worked on with them and got it. And all we did to make that then was not to make a better trumpet, because what does that even mean? Someone would say, oh, I prefer this one, you know, and they'd be right. They do prefer that one. Um, I made a trumpet, worked with Shargle to make a trumpet that in every aspect we possibly could, and we kept trying things and doing things, wanted, so that it almost seems like there's no trumpet. When I pick it up, I go, that's the sound I was going to make anyway, whether I had a trumpet or not. And so it's not fighting me at all. And so um, uh, that's so the choice of gear then, when you try a different mouthpiece, don't go, gee, does this one make my sound like this or make it like that? It doesn't make anything. I always say, imagine the sound in your head. This is particular. But this is always important, but boy, it's important when you're trying gear. I see people pick up a horn and go, I'll try this one. And they blow it. And I say, stop, what are you doing? They go, I'm going to blow the horn and see what sound it makes. And I go, and in your head, you want to make and make that sound. They go, well, then how will I tell whether it's the horn for me? I'll go by how easy it is, but always make the sound. And so when they see me testing trumpets, I don't say to anyone in the room, how's that one sound? They all sound identical. But I know this one was easiest to do that on. That's mm. the best one for me. And so with that approach, I don't get down this rabbit hole where I'm always looking for the horn or the mouthpiece for some bit of gear to give me something that I haven't already got. I'm looking for, some, you know, if there's anything left in the gear that I've got where I go, well, I have to sort of push it a bit to make it do that. We'll go, well, okay, if there's a piece of gear that'll make take that away. So I'm almost looking for the gear not to give me something. I'm making sure the gear's not taking anything away or standing in the way of what I want to do. And um, yeah, but to that extent, the gear is very important and there's all those aspects to it. And, um, and I, I like the idea. I'm very aware of the placebo effect and how we, uh, you know, um, right. if you tell someone, try this mouthpiece, man, this one's really great for playing high and give them a reason. Mm-hmm. Uh, they'll try it and they'll get another, they'll get an extra little bit of range out of it, you know, um, and it may be identical to the one they were just playing. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and so I love it when I, I know that a bit of gear is doing what I think it's doing or what it's supposed to do because it did it before I was told what it's supposed to do. And the mouthpiece I use is, is a really good case in point. It's called an Apridato, and it's also made by Shargle. And they got this bright idea that, um, you know, when you, when you play a mouth, buzz into a mouthpiece when it's in a trumpet, the mouthpiece itself vibrates. And if you put a sensor on the outside of it, just near it, in the air, a very sensitive one, it'll pick up those vibrations. You can look at them on an oscilloscope. So you're making the air vibrate either side of your mouthpiece, like all around it. That's wasted energy. So, of course, this is well known. So they started making heavier, fatter mouthpieces. You know those mouthpieces, you can get like huge chunks of metal and they vibrate less. So Mm -hmm. more of the energy is going through the horn. But they still vibrate. So it's like a soundproof room. All you're trying to do is stop vibrations getting in and out. You don't make the walls thicker. Everyone knows in a studio, you put a cavity. You put an inner wall and an outer wall, put a space between them, you'll stop the vibration, or largely stop the vibrations. If you could, and it's not practical with a building, you'd fill the cavity with water. Mm-hmm. That really, anything that does excite the first wall will never get the second wall going if there's water in between. So the Apridato is a dual wall mouthpiece. There's an inner mouthpiece and there's an outer casing, and it's filled with water. Wow. And that's how it works. Now, I know all that now. But when I got this parcel in, in, in the mail from Shargal, try this new mouthpiece, no one told me any of this. I said, oh, it's kind of fat looking. Okay. And I put it in. I didn't know what it was supposed to do. And I never read the instructions on anything. So I just played it. And I didn't notice suddenly I was better or any, it was easier. It felt good. So I played it. But after a couple of weeks, I had a trip. And coincidentally, it was to Austria, to uh, near Vienna, where Shargal is based. And I had this concert. When I got there off this long flight from Australia, I took the horn out, I played, and I just just had that edge missing. You know, when you feel like, is there a bit of fluff stuck in my mouthpiece, my horn somewhere from the case, or is, something, is there a dent? Did I get a dent on the flight that I can't see? You know, that that little thing when you get a dent maybe in the end of your tuning slide, and just it was just off. Right. I went, mm. so I went to them and I said, there's something wrong with my horn. And they put a light down and they look at this, we can't find anything wrong with the horn. And then Robert Shargle, who was there, one of the brothers that runs the company, he, he shook the mouthpiece. He said, there's no water in your Apridato. I said, there's no water in my what? <laughs> he said, this is called an Apridato. Didn't you read the thing we sent you? I said, no. He said, it would have come to you filled with water. I went, where? And he says, no, it screws apart. I didn't even know. He said, it's empty. He said, you must have not had it done up properly on the flight and it's come out with the, you know, the altitude. He went and filled it up, gave it back, said, try it now. And I played and the horn was back. I said, well, that's a really good double blind trial. 
because yeah. I didn't even know what it was supposed to do. I didn't even know it was the mouthpiece. I just knew something was wrong. So this mouthpiece definitely makes a difference. But it was that kind of difference that only after I'd had it for a couple of weeks when you took it away, I noticed. Mm -hmm. When I first played it, it just felt good. But once it was not there and the water was not there, I went, I've just lost a tiny little bit of power or something here. I don't know why. So that kind of gear testing I love where I don't know what it's supposed to do and yet I can feel something. And, uh, and, and if someone changes it without me knowing and I notice it, then I know it's for real. It's not placebo. So, uh, but yeah, gear, man, all the technicalities of it, there are experts on that and I'm certainly not one of them, but I know we worked long and hard to sort of get a horn where I said, yeah, this horn wants to do what I want to do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, and I love that, that attitude of, you know, not looking for the horn to give you something, but just, you know, basically get out of the way. And, uh, yeah, everything does have its own, uh, you know, you know, unique resonant frequencies and, you know, where the resistance yep. is, things like that. And it is an individual thing. And when oh, yeah. you, when you can just pick something up and it's, you're not fighting the horn, uh, yeah. you know, which, the, which is kind of a stupid saying anyway, because the horn doesn't, isn't doing anything, but just being itself, you know, yeah. and, and it's just, you know, that, that, like you said, the idea of, uh, you know, it wants to be bright. Okay. So when you, when you push, when you put air in it, that's where it's going to want to go anyway. So that's really cool. And I, I hopefully that will help, um, some people that are in search of, uh, new gear of how to approach <laughs> it, you know, which I, I know everybody's always looking for gear. All right. So we're going to do our final segment here. And this yep. is a, um, a rapid fire round is brought to us by uh, my good friends uh, at Robinson's Remedies, uh, Mr. Kenny Robinson mm -hmm. and Richard McCamall. Uh, and this is called the Robinson's Remedy Rapid Fire Round. It's a series of questions that are going to be all over the place. And uh, I just want your quickest response to uh, okay. these questions. So I feel uh, like I should have a buzzer. You should. <laughs> uh, yeah. So we're going to get into the mind of Mr. James Morrison in five, four, three, two, and one. Here we go. James, who's the biggest influence in your life that's not a trumpet player? My father. Uh, what's your favorite book? The Power of Now. Uh, what's the worst movie you've ever seen? Um, it was called The Langoliers. All right. Uh, if you weren't a trumpet player slash saxophone player slash trombonist, uh, what would you want to do? Uh, sail. I do sail, but I'd, just, I'd be a sailor. All right. Um, What's your favorite drink? Water. Uh, you could have a dinner party and invite any three living people. Who would you invite? Mm. Rapid fire. I, I, the only reason I'm hesitating, I know exactly who I want to invite, but I need four. Um, <laughs> um, um, it's going to be a boring, trite-sounding answer, but I invite my wife and my three sons, so I guess I'd work out who to leave out. Is she listening? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, we'll, we'll expand it to four for you. That, that's fine. Thank you. <laughs> there you go. All right, you, uh, same, same dinner party, but you can invite any three additional people who are no longer with us, any three people from history. Oh, dear departed friends, Ray Brown, um, Dizzy, and, hmm, boy, hard one. Someone that probably a lot of listeners won't know, but a, a wonderful musician. He was a multi-instrumentalist too, an American that moved to Australia named Tom Baker. And that'd be a fun party with Dizzy, Tom and Ray, let me tell you. All right. Next question. Lacquer, plated or raw? Plated. All right. What's your favorite quote? Life. There's no rehearsal. This is the gig. Okay. Hopefully it's a good paying gig. Uh, what is your greatest fear? <laughs> Should I say that again? What is your greatest fear? Of being afraid. Okay. Uh, you could be granted one superpower. What would it be? Uh, the ability to travel through time. Okay. What aspect of trumpet playing do you find to be the most overrated? Overrated meaning people think it's great and it's not, or uh, meaning that you know so much emphasis is put on it, you know, more than than it deserves. Oh, okay. A aspect of trumpet playing. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely, playing high. 
Okay. Does anyone ever say anything but that? Surely that's the answer. <laughs> there, there, there have been, trust me, there have been a few people who have not said playing high. Wow. Uh, but uh, yeah, but, but that, that seems to be the the uh, the answer, the the, mm-hmm. the most common answer. Uh, but this one, this is this one has a little bit of difference. Uh, what aspect of trumpet playing do you feel is the most underrated? The most underrated aspect of trumpet playing is that feeling when you're holding a long, quiet note and it's the last note and when you just can't quite tell has it ended yet or not. You know, if you do a diminuendo, you can do it. You know, it's a horrible feeling when it stops early. But when you get that, that thing where a trumpet note just trails off and you're not even sure if it's stopped yet, that's one of the greatest things you can do on the trumpet. And it's not done often enough. Mm, okay. I have to try that one. Um, speaking of your your superpower, uh, you can go back in time and oh, get, great. and give your younger self one piece of advice about music. What would it be? Wow, I'm going to have to answer like this, as unsatisfactory as it might be. If I had the opportunity to do that, I'd shut up. <laughs> I wouldn't give my I wouldn't say a word because I might mess it up. It's worked out just fine. <laughs> All right. I like that answer. Um, and uh, you can give yourself uh, one, one piece of advice about life. Gee, you know, I've got to give the same answer. It's not that I knew or know everything about life, but the whole purpose, my whole paradigm of life, the whole purpose of it is to experience it and watch it unfold. So the idea of going back and sort of subverting some of that or skipping some of that sounds like a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've always had a, a a thing about time travel, you know, like all these movies and TV shows and things like that that, that touch on time travel. It's like, yeah, you know, I, I the only advice I would really probably give myself is just, you know, it it's all going to work out in the end. Yeah. yeah, you know, and just don't don't and don't waste the energy worrying. If I had to give myself some advice, I would give that. But even that advice, I feel like no. I got so much out of learning that, exactly. discovering that it's all going to work out. And I don't want to just be told. Yeah. Um, now, the reason I want my superpower to be time travel is because um, I want to go. I don't want to go and give advice to me or anybody else. I want to go and just see certain things and experience them, and probably just probably confirm something I suspect that human beings haven't changed and never will, but they just keep manifesting the same types of things because we're human in different ways. I, I, I know I want to experience the different ways in different eras. Yeah. Different, different technology. Kind of cool to go back to Fifty Second Street too. Yeah, <laughs> that would be fun. We get a good chance to actually sit down and, and like listen to some of the the greats, yeah. like be there in the front row. And you know. yeah, yeah. So. All right, uh, we have one final question for you, sir. Um, what do you want your legacy to be? Well, I feel like a beauty, um, uh, you know, contestant entrant. You know, I want yeah. world peace. You know, they'll say that, <laughs> but. Um, <laughs> But it, it is it is a fairly generic answer because I don't I just don't act in terms of creating a legacy. I act for now. But I suppose that means if I'm always acting for now, I would like to think if there is a legacy that, as I say, it's kind of the beauty contestant answer that the world is you know somewhat better for me having passed through it in some way. Um, it's not uh, it's not specific because to have in mind a specific legacy would then start to dictate how I'd need to behave then to make sure that legacy happens. And I'm too busy with right now. The leg- You know what I want my legacy to be? Whatever it's going to be for someone who lives now. Yeah. Oh, well, that is amazing. I love it. I love it. I love it. And I am so grateful that uh, you took time to be with me. Uh, for this episode, I know you're just you're a tremendously busy man, um, and you know you're just you're an inspiration uh, to so many people as a musician. But hopefully, this uh, gets them into the why and the mind of James Morrison, and see that uh, the inspiration that you give goes way beyond uh, just the music that you produce. So, thank you very much, and uh, I I look forward to being able to. Uh, establish a, a, a deeper relationship with you as, as time goes on. And, and uh, I think we have a, a lot of, uh, a lot of things that we could talk about and, and hopefully one you day bet. we'll be able to do that uh, in a McLaren. So, 
So uh, thank you again very much. And thank you for spending time with us today on the Trumpet Guru's Hang. Make sure that you check out all the links in the show notes. Uh, check out what James has got going on. And, uh, you know, if you're interested in, in learning more about the James Morrison uh, programming uh, that he has in terms of uh, both the, the online work and even his Academy of Music, you can certainly check that out and um, you won't be disappointed. So, James, my friend, thank you very much. And to all of our viewers and listeners, as always, peace and slide grease. We're out. Hey, thank you so much for hanging with us today. This podcast is all about creating connection through our mutual love for the trumpet life. I hope that you learned a few things about today's guest and had some laughs along the way. Don't forget to give us a review. We love those five-star ratings. And please share this podcast with your friends. We want to see our hang grow for show. Have a suggestion for a future topic or a guest? Hit me up at thetrumpetgurus at gmail.com. Our opening theme was written and performed by Lexi Signor, and all other music comes courtesy of The Greatest Funeral Ever. So in the words of W.C. Handy, life is like a trumpet. If you don't put anything into it, you don't get anything out. So go out there and let your trumpet sound, and I'll see you at the next hang.